my talk's going to be about uh, the transceivers from ADI. Um, we'll talk a little bit, or probably a lot, about um, the 9360 uh, series. And then I'll go into some of the uh, newer, uh, a little bit more advanced transceivers, including the 71, 75, and uh, the newest guy, the ADRV 9009. Um, and if you're wondering, is this talk for me? If you have any of these devices, uh, this talk is for you. Um, the 9361, 63, 64 um, is a hyper popular transceiver um, and is used all over the place. So these pictures are just from the first page of Google Images that I found. Um, and if I just kept scrolling, I bet I'd find a, a ton more radios. Um, if you're a manufacturer in the room using 9361 and your device isn't up here, uh, sorry. Okay. Um, just, just some basics here. Uh, when we're talking about uh, transceivers uh, from ADI, um, they're, they're, they have a specific architecture. Uh, and in the general um, uh, literature, there are three main architectures. There, there's Superhead, uh, there's Zero IF, uh, and then there's uh, direct uh, RF type devices. Um, and all the ADI transceivers are the Zero IF uh, style. So it's just a mixer uh, and some uh, uh, entities and, and DDAs. Um, with uh, a bunch of other stuff that uh, makes them really, really good devices. Um, and uh, since uh, a lot of this stuff is actually hidden under the uh, APIs that vendors provide. So if you're using H UHD, uh, you have a really nice interface to the device, and you can just set things like sample rate and uh, uh, you know, bandwidth, and all of these settings get automatically calculated for you or triggered. Uh, and of course, ADI makes uh, our own versions, uh, or our own development boards for, uh, for the 9361 or 6364 series of devices, uh, including Pluto. So if you got a Pluto this week, uh, this transceiver uh, is, uh, is in your device. Now, there was actually this really interesting news article uh, done by uh, Zepto Bars, where they did a complete breakdown, or I'll say complete breakdown of the 9361, and they made this uh, quote, uh, when microchips are more profitable than drugs. Um, I would say that analysis is a little off because they don't include R&D and, and, and stuff uh, in, in, their, uh, in their cost, but uh, it's, it's a very popular part. Um, and if you want to, I, I would highly recommend going to this article and uh, looking at the breakdown of the transceiver. Uh, we found it super interesting. Uh, and a little shocking, too. Now, um, to support the transceivers, uh, we provide a lot of support and infrastructure around them. Um, this includes uh, additional hardware, like we provide an up-down converter if you want to go to lower frequencies. Um, we provide more like um, end product solutions like Pluto. Uh, we provide software from uh, LibIO drivers and kernel drivers, um, something a little bit more bare metal uh, called our NoOS drivers. Um, we don't really have a logo. That's why I have this car that's like super stripped down and uh, these drivers will run on a like a $2 microcontroller if you want to, and a lot of people do that. Uh, and we, of course, provide HTL, and that includes designs for both uh, Intel, Altera, uh, and Xilinx. And we, we provide a lot of solutions, so you can kind of you know, size or apply um, the necessary software pieces to your problem. Right? So if you have a very low power application where you don't have a massive FPGA, you might want to use the NoS drivers and you know, might not want to run full, a full Linux stack uh, on your uh, endpoint device. Okay. Uh, in this picture, you've probably seen uh, like 100 times at this point. Uh, it's, it's the simplified diagram uh, of the 9361. Uh, the, the one of the internal docs is a little bit more interesting, but there's a lot of configuration that's available in the part. Um, there's a lot of knobs to turn, and there's a lot of ways to get it wrong. And but there's a lot of things that you can hide by um, removing this, this complexity in the device. Um, on, on the bottom, what, I hear, what, I ha what I'm showing here is just the basic attributes that are available. If you list them in the I.O. devices, um, the debug attributes, I think, are like three times uh, uh, th this list. But if you want to really understand how the transceivers work uh, fundamentally, uh, there is a ton of documentation that's available on both uh, the Analog Devices Wiki as well as user guides that exist. Um, they're a great read. I would highly recommend them. About 400 pages. They'll uh, put you right to sleep. 
Uh, I've read them front to back probably 20 times. But I'm also responsible for uh, supporting these devices. Now, but if you want to access these attributes, you can do that today with our newer uh, I.O. source and, and, and sync blocks, which are available in our auditory module for uh, the transceivers. Okay. So I'm just going to go through some of the features, uh, more advanced features that are provided. Um, in, the, in the transceiver itself, there's a loopback path that you can use uh, called digital loopback. Um, and this is uh, just a, uh, in the middle. This is the transceiver on the left. And on the right is actually in the FPGA. So uh, on the, the left is the kind of the interface into uh, the transceiver. Uh, and in the middle is our uh, HDL cores that we provide. And they include things like um, uh, DC correction filters, um, IQ uh, correction um, uh, multiplies, um, DDSs if you want to use them, and kind of generate signals on, on the board itself. And if you're in HD, uh, digital loopback mode, uh, data just passes uh, from the, the DMAs uh, through these IP cores and then back. And if you're doing some testing, this is a really great way to understand uh, if what you're sending is what you think you're sending. Uh, alternatively, there's another mode called RF loopback. So if you want to do some analog testing or set the device up in like a repeater mode where you're receiving on one frequency and want to transmit that data out uh, on another frequency, uh, that's really uh, a useful tool. And we were actually showing that off quite a bit in uh, the seminar sessions. Um, and if you're just using the part normally, this is how the data kind of populates through uh, from the DMAs all the way out uh, to uh, the LVDS interfaces. Now looking back at uh, specifically the receive chain right here, uh, in red I have highlighted uh, most of the digital pieces and including uh, just the, uh, the, the front end analog filter. How the part is designed is that the ADC is actually a sigma delta. So you get about four and a half bits out of it. And then you use the downstream half bands to grow the remaining uh, bits up to 12. And this includes the programmable FIR as well. Now we have a tool that's designed to uh, help you design and set up those rates. So you can um, get the uh, design those half bands, or excuse me, set up those half bands and design a fur that's specifically for your waveform. And why is this important? So uh, I'm just using a, a little application called IO scope here. And I have a, a Pluto hooked up. So this has a 9363 inside of it. And what I'm going to do is set the LOs to be the same. So we're just loop, looping back across the antennas. And I'll load up a, a wideband waveform. So LTE 20. And you can see a little bit of uh, droop uh, in the passband, as well as uh, a ton of noise, actually. And it's, it's uh, looping upward uh, on the skirts uh, of the signal. Okay. And this noise comes from the sigma delta itself. So as Matt kind of talked about earlier, um, sigma deltas insert noise into the system into an area of the signal that you don't care about. But if you don't set up the signal correctly, or set up the system correctly, that noise will appear in your signal. And what we've done beforehand is use uh, our ADI 9361 filter wizard, which is available in MATLAB. We've designed an LTE filter specifically for this signal. And we'll load that filter up. And you can see that the um, out-of-band signals, or the out-of-band noise, has been uh, decreased pretty severely. We can increase the averaging just so it's more obvious. And then the passband is, is a lot flatter. So using the FIR correctly is really important for your waveform. Okay. Now, if you don't have MATLAB, we have a C version of the filter designer. So you can uh, pass it a lot of parameters if you want to, or a few parameters. Uh, and it will design a fur that's designed for the, uh, uh, for a specific waveform or for a specific configuration. And this will actually uh, give you the half band configuration as well. Um, and this is available today 
uh, in our uh, library called lib ad9361. Uh, and if you're installing the GRIO blocks, that's a, that's a dependency for them. Okay. So a uh, an, an earlier talk yesterday uh, by uh, Robert, um, he was talking about the AGC uh, in uh, in the earlier uh, Blade RF and the current one that's using the 61. Um, the AGC has a lot of knobs, uh, and it's meant to be tuned. And these this is the parameters that you have access to in the AGC. So there are a ton, ton of knobs. Um, but fortunately, what we do is we have a simulation, an RF simulation model that um, models both the RF pieces as well as the digital pieces and the AGC. So if you want to do uh, really fine tuning of the AGC, this is where you do it. And this model is built into MATLAB, so you can um, uh, use it as a typical like channel model if you wanted to, um, but here we're just uh, feeding in a CW tone, and I'll start this. Um, this is built on a tool called RF Block Set, so it is an RF simulation. Uh, it's not a transistor level model; it's more of a behavioral level model, so it won't take um, a decade to to pass a waveform through it. We're just still compiling at the bottom. Come on. But this model is really useful if you want to, one, understand the AGC or uh, where sources of noise might exist in the system. This model has been uh, verified against real hardware in the lab. Uh, includes things like uh, IMDB uh, performance, um, noise sources. Um, doo -doo. Still initializing. Okay. And you can look inside of it and, and see how things are configured. Uh, the AGC is actually written in um, a tool called Stateflow. which is designed to uh, model states in the system. So it, it covers slow attack, fast attack, and, uh, uh, and, and manual mode as well. And this is super useful when you want to tune the AGC for your specific waveform. Okay. And you can look at how the, like for example, the sigma deltas are modeled in the system. And you can insert probes into different parts of the receive chain which you can't do on the physical chip. Okay. Now, next thing. So, can the 9361 frequency hop? There's a paper actually done in 2016 um, uh, on this topic. Uh, it was a very, very well done paper, um, but it, it used the, the B200, B210, uh, B, uh, uh, and E310, all which have the 9361 uh, and 64 uh, parts in them. Um, and how would the tests were run is that they would start a hop by doing a uh, set center frequency call and then check when the LO locked. And this gave them uh, a, I would say, pretty high um, hop rate or dwell time. Um, but I would say it can get much worse. Uh, due to calibrations that are required in the part. So this will go up to 100 milliseconds. But if you want to do this um, faster, or a lot faster, you use something called um, uh, fast lock profiles. And this will get you down to 25 microseconds, which is way, way faster. Okay. Um, how this works is that you set eight profiles up. Uh, beforehand, and each profile, each profile is associated with a certain frequency that you want to hop to. And you want to hop, and when, when a, you want to change frequency, you just um, uh, write a spy command, or you use pin control to change to uh, a different profile. And if you have more than eight frequencies, 
you just can load more uh, through the baseband processor uh, in parallel. And we have a little app that uh, shows you how to do this using uh, IOScope. Um, it's kind of complicated, but it will generate a, um, uh, basically a, a spectrum, uh, uh, it's a spectrum analyzer across uh, a given band that you want. And it will load profiles, save them, create them, uh, all uh, on the fly uh, uh, behind the scenes for you. And this is just an example of, of it working. Um, and for best performance, run this on a Z board or on a uh, development board platform. Because if you're going through Ethernet or USB, you're going to have to deal with that latency. OK. So another big question that we get a lot is, I, uh, I want to build a phase array system with 9361. How do I synchronize multiple chips together? Okay. So there's a, um, a feature called multi-chip sync, or MCS, in the documentation. And what this will do is synchronize the, ba the baseband, or the time domain, the, the time domain baseband of the signal, okay. not the RF portion. So you'll still have phase ambiguity between two different vices if um, when you're using multi-chip synchronization. There is no RF synchronization built into the 9361. Um, and how multi-chip synchronization works uh, is you bring up both parts, uh, you um, run this function call that's in our lib9361 library. That will go through the necessary steps to set up the parts, and the, um, the data coming out of all the ADCs will be time-aligned. Okay. But what about if I want to do um, phase alignment for an application like direction finding, or if it's a requirement for my MIMO system. We have a, a solution for this called the FMCOMS5, which has two uh, 9361s on it. So it's a 4x4 four four system. Um, it's a cool looking board, tons of SMAs. Um, you have to get pretty close and read all, all the, the, the SMA markers uh, to make sure you set things up correctly. Uh, but it's a, it's a really interesting board to develop on. Um, but there's some additional switching on it to allow you to do phase uh, synchronization or phase calibration. And this is done by using the IQ correction as well as the DDSs in our HDL. So what we do is uh, we take chip A, uh, we send uh, a, uh, a signal using the DDSs out through uh, some of the RF switching, feed that back into the, sec the, uh, the, uh, the first channel, and then use the FPGA as a reference for us. Then we switch over to the second chip, take another phase measurement using the FPGA as a reference, and now both our RXs are aligned because we know their relative <coughs> phase difference based off of the FPGA. And then finally, we, uh, uh, we, we synchronize the, the TX side on chip B. Uh, and this is all implemented in uh, IO scope as well as a C library that we provide. So the same C library that has the filter uh, wizard built into it. OK. Now, another question we get is why just not use an external LO? Right, because both our front ends will be driven by the, uh, you know, this, the, the same LO, and uh, th they'll have to be matched. Uh, that's actually not correct. So there's a front divider that's not showed in the, uh, the simplified diagram uh, for the LOs. There's a divider, uh, so the LO that you provide has to be twice the frequency that you want to operate on, and it will provide, and uh, when you do this, the divider provides a random 180 degree shift. And this is completely random at startup. The switching will allow you to fix this, though. Okay, uh, so the next feature that the chip has, has is an integrated state machine. There are two modes. Uh, one is FDD and one is TDD. Um, it's really implemented to reduce power of the transceiver, um, reduce self-interference uh, so you're not transmitting on the same frequency that you're receiving at, uh, as well as simplify some of the MAC designs uh, if, if you have a TDD-based system or a random access type system. Uh, and it can be controlled through SPI or through, uh, through pin control as well if you need something that's super deterministic uh, and, and fast. Um, but they have these, the, these kind of states that you can evolve through uh, based on um, uh, your, your setup or your, if you're in TDD or, or FDD mode. 
and how these are controlled uh, through the pins are through an enable and a, a TX uh, and RX pin. And there are, there are two actual modes that you can have uh, depending on how you want to control those pins. And this is super deterministic based off the, the, uh, the FB clock. Also, if you want to, uh, to develop a TDD-based system, we have some supplemental uh, HDL. So we have an IP core that will sit in between the 61 uh, and the DMAs. So if you want to synchronize uh, DMA transfers uh, as well as control of those enable and uh, TX and RX pins, uh, we have uh, an HDL core that's designed exactly for this. Uh, and it includes an, an I.O. driver. Uh, where you can set up these profiles that are like, here are my durations uh, of, of my windows, uh, here's how I, I should uh, change states, and here's just some, some output of uh, jumping back and forth between transmit and receive uh, with this TDD core. Okay, so let's move on to, to uh, another transceiver. Um, the next uh, generation of transceivers is the 9371 uh, and 75 series, so there are two variants. Um, the main difference here is that uh, we're bumping up the data rate from uh, 56 megahertz to 100 megahertz. Uh, on the RX side, on the TX side, there, it's 250 megahertz, uh, as well as there's dedicated observer uh, or sniffer paths. Um, but this, uh, this, this chip uses a JSD uh, interface. Okay. So when you're comparing with the, with the 61, obviously there's more bandwidth. Uh, you have uh, uh, other paths in the system, including observer uh, and sniffer, um, much more higher dynamic range, much more linearity in the system, um, but you're, it's way more power hungry than the 9361. Um, but with that power comes uh, really beautiful linearity specs. Um, it has fully independent RX and observer paths, which are really useful if you're doing things like um, uh, DPD, uh, applications or implementations. Um, each of the paths have their own dedicated calibrations. Um, and uh, if you're running algorithms like DPD or, or CLCG, CLGC uh, um, uh, on the basement processor, uh, it's really useful to have those dedicated paths. And you have this beautiful flat spectrum with this part. Now, if we look at the signal chain, uh, it's slightly different than, than 9361. Um, first, there is no LNA out front. Um, uh, so there's a lot less uh, gain in 9361 by, or 9371 by default. There's also a, uh, a second, um, uh, or excuse me, there's a, there's a, a different um, half-band configuration. So there are two decimated by five filters. One is designed for high rejection. Um, and at the end, there's this real IF mode that, that, uh, that people use. And as I mentioned before, uh, it's JSD based. Now, for those who don't know uh, what JSD means, um, on, LVD, on uh, 9361, it has an LVDS interface, or CMOS. Um, and there was this really uh, nice diagram provided, uh, uh, created by TI um, with uh, the analogy I like to use is that uh, LVDS is kind of like a, a, uh, you know, a desert road where you can uh, you know, drive anywhere you want. It, it could be you know, 10 cars wide, uh, but you're only going to go so fast. And uh, layout is going to be more difficult the more lanes in, uh, that you get. Now, JSD, on the other face, uh, on the other hand, um, is designed to reduce the amount of connections between uh, a transceiver and an FPGA. However, there's a lot more complexity in uh, the JSD interface. It has a full protocol stack, um, but it's more like a highway, so you can go, uh, you know, 100 miles an hour on it. Speeds are a lot higher. Uh, on the JSE interface. Okay. But ADI provides uh, IP for both Xilinx and Altera if, uh, uh, if you're using JSD today with ADI parts. And it's provided in a dual license method, so it's under the GPL2, uh, which is really for uh, evaluation uh, and testing in your environment. But if you want to ship something in your product without uh, GPLing your whole project or all of your IP, uh, there is a commercial license available as well. Okay. Um, and just the, the last piece of uh, 9371. Uh, the, there's a variant called the 9375, which has integrated DPD, and we have a, a full uh, cell reference design for that. 
And uh, the, if, for those not familiar with DPD, um, it's designed to uh, reduce um, spectral regrowth uh, in your transmissions. So when you're really pushing on your, um, uh, uh, on your 1 dB compression point in your amplifier, you'll get spectral regrowth, as uh, Robin talked about earlier today. Uh, and a way to solve this is you pre-distort your, your signal. And this is built into the 9375. Okay. So the new guy on the market is the ADRV 9008 and 9009. So um, RV, RV stands for Radioverse. Um, and the big jump here is that you're going from 100 megahertz to 200 megahertz. However, it's only a TDD part. So there's a single PLL in the part. So transmit and receive are both driven by that PLL. Okay. If we look at the, the block diagram, uh, we, they remove that high rejection filter. So there's only a, a single decimate by five. Uh, but there's also some, uh, an extra LO uh, on the front end, which is used uh, in a special way. Um, and the, the third main difference is that there's this IF conversion stage, which is new. Okay. And how this IF conversion stage works is that there are two NCOs in it that you can program, um, and uh, a set of three filters. One is a interpolator, a decimator, and uh, just a straight um, uh, half band filter. Um, a way you would use this is if you had, say, a, uh, a multi-carrier GSM signal, uh, which we're showing here in the top left, that's offset slightly. You can use the NCO to shift it down, reduce the bandwidth a little bit, and then the uh, output JSD rate could be lower um, using less power. And these NCOs are uh, highly configurable, uh, but the, the filters are fixed. Okay. Um, the observer path is actually capable of 450 megahertz uh, of received bandwidth, and this is accomplished by using this uh, aux PLL in the system. And what it does is it uses uh, all four ADCs uh, and then uses some stitching, uh, a few filters, uh, and then you get a single IQ stream out the other side that's 450 megahertz wide. Um, however, in observation mode, uh, you're not, you're, you can't use the AGC uh, and there's a slight degradation uh, in linearity. Okay. Uh, another interesting feature of uh, 9009 is that it has an integrated frequency hopping mode. Uh, it works in, in two steps. Uh, first is the setup phase, where you provide it the minimum and maximum frequency that you want. It will calibrate over all those frequencies uh, and then go to the, the first frequency that you request. And then when you want to hop, you provide it a spy write, which is the next frequency, uh, and then you provide it uh, just a, a pin control uh, uh, enable, and then it hops to the next frequency. And it will do this at uh, a 50 microsecond uh, dwell time, or, or 60 microseconds, excuse me. Um, so compared to 9361, uh, it's slightly slower, but you, have, uh, you don't have to sideload profiles. Okay. Uh, now for, for 9361, we do have a, a SOM variant, and for 9370, or excuse me, 9009, we have a new SOM that's coming out. Uh, which has a, uh, a very large ultra scale on it uh, with about 600K uh, uh, logic cells and uh, uh, 225,000 DSP slices, which is a lot. Um, but it will have two uh, ADRV 9009s on it. So it will be 4C, 4 transmit. Uh, and you'll be able to, uh, here's the kind of like the block diagram uh, of the new SOM that's coming out. Uh, it has uh, four gigs of. Uh, DDR4 directly for the, the, the PL, and then four as well for the, 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 uh, the, pro, the uh, arm as well. Now, a really nice feature of, of 9009 is it's designed to be uh, phase coherent and phase aligned across multiple chips. So if you're building a massive MIMO system, a large phase array, this is the chip to go to. It's designed from this, for this uh, application from the ground up. And the SOMs that we're building as well uh, will be designed for this. So if you want to big, uh, build a big phase array, uh, this will be a, a very good platform for that. Okay. Um, and as ever, we're investing in newer transceivers, and more are coming. Okay. Okay. 
So I kind of went through a lot of features. Um, there are more things that are available in the parts. Um, I would highly recommend uh, looking at the user guides that exist on the transceivers. Um, so if you have you know, like a B2, uh, P200, uh, look at the feature set that's available. Because the, the parts are capable of a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, and if you have questions about the, the transceivers or any of our parts, uh, you can always ask at uh, engineerzone at uh, easy.analog.com. Okay. That's all I got. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you, Travis. All right. Are there any questions for Tree? All right, Dan and Dave. Sorry, this is a really boring question, but very early on in your slides, you had um, you had a, one of the diagrams of the ninety three sixty one, mm -hmm. and you made a comment about bit growth. Yes. And there was like plus one, plus two. I've seen this before. Is that actually showing the bit growth there, or is that has to do with the filtering? So like here? Yeah, see so yeah, how there's uh, like plus one, just, plus two, plus three above uh, the half Those are actually divide by one, divide uh, by two, divide uh, by three. I see, yeah. <laughs> um, so they're all the half band settings. All right, David. Hi, interesting presentation. Um, these are obviously complex systems. So what's, what's your recommended for a client or customer? What size team would you need to implement these, right? Because maybe for tier one customers, you can support them, but you can't support everyone designing yeah. these in. So uh, like tier ones might have an army of FPGA programmers uh, or software developers. Um, and that's why we provide HDL um, software drivers um, different versions of software drivers, um, as well as devices like the SOMs. So if you don't want to do a chip down approach, um, you can uh, you know, start off a design from, from that perspective. Um, so use a SOM and, and yes. use that as a system. That's, that's, the, that's the, the fastest way to, to get to production. Um, in terms of team size, uh, that's dependent on the capabilities of your team. Sure, but you're talking, ha what, half a dozen, dozen people? Or no. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's dependent sense. on the team. It's hard to make. Right. Um. Any other audience questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Travis. <laughs>